All right. I'm going to begin by reading Isaiah 9, starting in verse 6. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. How many times have you heard the Christmas story? How many times have you heard Hark the Herald Angel Sings or sang Silent Night? Collectively, if we were to all tally it up, it'd probably be like a million in this, right? And as we come to this Christmas Eve service, how many times have you seen a preacher get up and try to come up with a new way to share the same old story? probably as many times as you've been alive. And over the past two months, I knew that I had the Christmas Eve service message coming, and that was on my shoulders. How many times have people heard this story of sweet baby Jesus? And how can I put a spin on it that's interesting? But I will say that it is also true true for as many times as I have heard the Christmas story, As many times as I have heard a preacher get up here, one of the things that has happened in my life consistently is every single year, there's a new facet, there's a new angle, there's a new tidbit of the Christmas story that stands out to me, that is highlighted to me. And so today, as the kids are downstairs getting ready for the play, I wanted to share a few of those that came to me this year. So, as we walk through today... Today, on this fourth week of Advent, this is the week of love. And the candle that we lit today represents love. Because Jesus is the showcase of God's love. Because in the midst of our darkness, the light has shown. And that light offers us love. Now, this kind of love that is offered is not the kind of love that we are used to here on earth. Because the kind of love that we are used to here on earth comes with conditions. I will love you as long as this list of things is met. As long as this isn't broken, I will love you. As long as I have trust, as long as I fill in the blank. But this love is a different kind of love. Because the love that Christ comes and offers, and that is symbolized as the baby in a manger, laying in a feeding trough, As the Lord of the universe, cuddled tight in swaddling clothing, it means that love had come on earth. But what kind of love? It was love offered between God and man. That love meant that the gap that man had cleaved between the holiest of holies, which is God, through their sin that man could not reach across had been eliminated. It was a love of reconciliation. Now, I look around the room today, and I've been blessed to have been working here at Wanna Grove, pastoring here at Wanna Grove long enough to have seen some of those who gather with us today grow up. And they've gone off and they've moved all over the place gone to college, gone to different states. And they have come back and reconciled for just a moment and filled the house with joy, filled the house with different kinds of laughter that liven up the parents, that liven up the grandparents, that bring the real meaning of the season. Now I also know that there are those of us gathered here who there is that person that is not joining us today that won't be opening a present. But Christ's love is a reconciling kind of love. Okay. Until you're lo- 
The mics are working downstairs. <laughs> Go ahead and mute all of them. <laughs> but me, I got the floor. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> the kind of love that Christ offers is a reconciling love that bridges past the darkness in our life because he is light in our life, just like Jeff referenced in his communion meditation. That we have a hope in a future that goes beyond the six-foot grave. And it goes on into eternity, and that is offered to us through the Son. Now, what I want you to know is that in this Advent week of love, there is something that I want to point out, is that every single thing about this birth is intentional. It was not intentional by Mary. She would not have scheduled her birth in a manger. It was not intentional by jo Joseph. He would have not said, hey, let's go on an over-the-road journey on a donkey. But it was intentional by the God of the universe. The God of all things who created everything. I don't know. <laughs> I need to hurry up. <laughs> That's fine. So, the God of the universe had spun things into motion. And how can I say that? Because what happens after the birth in Matthew chapter 2, if you have your Bible and are quick, you can get to it. Matthew chapter 2, we're introduced to some new figures in this Advent story. Jesus has been born, and the angels have proclaimed to the shepherds, but something has happened cosmologically. The sky the planets and the stars have shifted. Let's see if you catch this in the Bible. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. Now, I don't know if you realize this, but there are a couple of interesting things that happen in these two verses. First, Jesus is born. And it has been some time. Time has passed. How much time, we don't know. But in this biblical account from Matthew, what we see is that the magi, the wise men, maybe even princes from lands afar, were watching creation. Their eyes were transfixed on the stars. See, because they didn't worship the God of Jacob and the God of Abraham. But they were looking around and they were studying the stars and something changed. Something shifted. And they somehow, I do not know what was special, but something caught their eye and they said, this is the star that symbolizes the king of the Jews has been born. The Messiah had come. Now if you were to continue reading in Matthew chapter 2, what you would find is that Herod and the Israelites, who were not from lands afar, who were the people who were supposed to be on the lookout for the Messiah, who were supposed to be watching, who were supposed to be on the watchtowers waiting for the Messiah to come, to restore them, to bring them life, to bring them nation, to bring them kingdom, the kingdom of God that would last forever, they were too busy upholding their own power. They were too distracted to notice the star had rose. Bethlehem is only like 12 miles from Jerusalem. Yet, King Herod was too busy focused on his power and too focused on his thing to even notice what was going on. Yet the wise men saw it from afar. The galaxies had aligned and they had only one response. We must come and worship him. Now the interesting part is that they came from lands afar seeking a king. Uh, not their own king, but to pay homage to a king that they knew was the king of kings and the lord of lords. So they came bearing gifts. Wise men bearing gifts for the king and they, they sought after him and they found him. Now they did not come to Jesus saying, Christ, give me something. Hey, we spotted your star. Can I have a seat in your 
office. No, they came giving their gifts to the baby. My special thought for this year is this. Many of us come to church. Many of us come to Christ saying, what about this is going to please me? I hope I like the music today. I hope the speaker's good. I hope it's air-conditioned. Man, I hope I don't have to stand for too long. I hope I don't have to sit next to... I want it to please me. I hope the church is good for me. I hope that I enjoy this. If not, I'm going to go find another church where I do enjoy it. But, what we need to do is we need to have the heart of the wise men. I've always liked the janky animation of that Rankin and Bass show, The Little Drummer Boy. Probably because the main character's name is Aaron. <laughs> There's probably no other reason. But as he jankily stutters along in claymation, I know that that story is not true. I know that biblically, this kid didn't show up. I know that Mary didn't have to go, yeah, sure, bang away on that drum, child. My baby's asleep. <laughs> on the top of my list of things I want to hear is rat-a-tat-tat. I just got him to sleep. What are we doing? Now, I know it's not true, but there is something at the heart of it that is more true than is false. At the heart of the little drummer boy is this. I don't even know what I have to bring, but I know I need to give you something, so I'm going to offer it to you, and this is the best I got. The only thing I have to give to you, king, is what I have here. And so I'm going to give it my all. I'm going to give you everything I have, and I'm going to lay it at your feet as my offering and my sacrifice. And the heart behind that, the heart behind a person coming to the babe in a manger, coming to Christ and saying, Don't, it's not about what pleases me, it's about what pleases you. It's not about what I get out of this relationship. It's about what you get. It's not about what I can do to build myself up, but instead it's about lifting you up because you're the more important one in this. You are the center of the universe, not I. And so I'm going to move myself out of the center of the universe. I'm going to put Christ there as the head. And so what I'm going to do is I'm not going to be so worried about what pleases me. I'm not going to be so worried about if it's going to make me feel good and ooey-gooey on the inside. Instead, I'm going to follow after Christ. Why? Because he is worth it. Because Christ is worth it. And that's what the Magi noticed. And that's what Aaron, the little drummer boy, noticed. Is he's worth what I have. And so I'm going to give it. My preferences? Out the window. Do you think it was Mary's preference? She was lauded by angels saying, you are a blessed one. You are chosen. She still had to give birth in a barn. I'm getting long-winded. It's fine. Allison told me it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> what I want is to bring pleasure to God. Did you know that God can smile when thinking of you? That when he thinks of Diana, there can be a smile on his face? Oftentimes when we think of God, it's like this. Better do your chores. You didn't do this. I'm always watching. You better not pout. You better not cry. I'm telling you what. Because i got a golden ticket to heaven right here. That's not what God is doing. When he thinks of his children, it brings a smile to his face. And all he wants us to do is unwrap that present. How many of us are waiting to see our kids or our family members just open that present we got for them? And we just sit there waiting and we smile when they open it. And they go, this? What? That's what God wants. He wants us to open the present that is relationship to Christ. And then do what pleases him. So, when I come to church, I want to sing in a way that pleases him. 
When I come to church, I want to pray in a way that pleases Him. And when I go to serve my neighbor, I want to love them as I love myself because I hope it pleases God. Everything I do is about what pleases Him most. And so I seek Him out. And I make what pleases God my mission, my modem of operation. It's the only thing I care about. What pleases you? In this moment, what would please you? In this moment, in this conversation, what would please you? When everyone goes start talking crazy at Christmas, let's keep it light. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's put Him at the center of the table. All right? Because He's the heart of what our lives are. He is the life. He is the bread of life. The greatest gift giver of all time is God. And he outdid us all. Yet somehow we have taken that Christmas tradition of giving gifts and we got it all twist turned upside down. Because we're human. And that's what our hearts do. But what we need to do is we need to search ourselves and ask God to search our hearts and say, what will please you most? What will please you most? I hate to say it, but my whole message could have been summed up in a quote up. It comes from one of my favorite Christmas movies of all time, way back in 1947. Had Cary Grant and David Nivens. Any Bo, top list of actors, David Nivens. All right. David Nivens plays a bishop. I'm not going to tell you the story. But it ends with him giving a, a message at a Christmas Eve service. And this is what the sermon said. Tell you a story of an empty stocking. Once upon a midnight clear, there was a child's cry. A blazing star hung over the stable. And wise men came with birthday gifts. And we haven't forgotten that night down through the centuries. We celebrate it with stars on our Christmas tree and the sounds of bells and with gifts, but especially with gifts. You give me a book and I give you a tie. Aunt Martha has always wanted an orange squeezer and Uncle Harry could do with a new pipe. We forget nobody, adult or child. All the stockings are filled, all that is, except one. And we have even forgotten to hang it up. The stocking is for the child born in a manger. It is his birthday we are celebrating. Don't ever let us forget that. Let us ask ourselves what he would wish for most. And then let each put in his share loving kindness, warm hearts, and outstretched hands of tolerance. All the shining gifts that make peace on earth. Would you pray with me? Mm -hmm.